Hey guys, my name is SickBOT1, and well, there's this guy Mark Oswalt who does a monthly video on the 25 biggest songs of each month based on data from the Hot 100. So I teamed up with True Music Reviews to rank the 25 biggest songs of May 2017. Why? Why not? Hey everyone, what's up? My name is True Music Reviews, and I've actually already rated some moves before, but this is my first time doing so collaboratively. Although Sick of B and I do disagree on the quality of a fair amount of songs, we decided to dive into this collab so we could discuss the 25 biggest hit songs of May 2017. Personally, I think 2017 has been doing alright, although I'm not a huge fan of some of this year's trends, especially Trap. But there's enough gems and rising stars to keep this year afloat with me. On the other hand, in my opinion, although it started off in a bit of a rough patch, 2017 actually has been a pretty good year for pop music so far. Although there has been a fair bit of garbage clogging up the top 20, a lot of truly great songs have also managed to become hits as well. My biggest issue of 2016 was that it was boring, it was stagnant, it was just a monotonous slog of tropical house. However, 2017 has seen the Billboard Hot 100 to be a lot more interesting, diverse, and fluid than it has been in years. But enough broad explanations, let's start with one of the few songs on this ranking we both agree was pretty awful. If you don't already know, Julia Michaels is a prominent songwriter who has penned genuinely enjoyable hits such as Sorry by Justin Bieber, Close by Nick Jonas, and All In My Head Flex by Fifth Harmony. However, she has also contributed to some pretty damn terrible songs like Hands to Myself by Selena Gomez and Heavy by Linkin Park. And really, regardless of her accomplishments as a songwriter, it's clear that her writing skills don't translate into actual singing talent. She strains her voice so much to make it sound like her relationship is doing harm to her, but the production isn't able to back her up. This demands an acoustic guitar arrangement or maybe even loud electronics, not this faux trap sound. Julia's voice cracks so much throughout the song that I'm quite certain that she has never had vocal training in her life. It's pretty damn clear that she is not ready to front her own song. It also really does not help that the writing of the song is completely insufferable. However, the two worst parts of the song are the off-key bridge and the unlistable central line. And one of them is how about I need to? One of the worst moments in pop music 2017, hands down. Next. Body like a back row, driving with my eyes closed. I already talked about this song as well as some others a while back in a top 20 ranking video, so I don't really have much to say here. It's dumb, it's stupid, it's dumb. You know why it's stupid, I know why it's stupid. I can't add anything, however the fact that a much better country song recently hit the top 20 fills me with relief. Save us, Brett Young. For fuck's sake, who thought that comparing a woman's body to a beat up road was a good idea? Sounds like Sam Hunt knows just as little about sex as Charlie Poof does. I mean, the melody of the harmony of the song just drills into your brain, stuck in your head for days in the worst way possible. Please don't listen to this dreck. I knew I loved you then, but you never know. I don't really care about this song. To me, the, the only notable thing about this is that James sounds like half of his face is numb at all times. And he looks like Pyrocynical, which I find that amusing for some reason. I don't know why. If we're being completely honest, I probably hate this song more than I should. Unlike most white guys with acoustic guitars, James actually does come off as sincere. However, when I hear this song on the radio, I just am filled with a sense of dread that makes me want to skip the song immediately. James Arthur's Kermit-like voice and the schmaltzy instrumental make the song pretty unbearable, even though it's only three and a half minutes long. Ed Sheeran, this guy is not. And in a year where Ed Sheeran is pretty dominant, I can feel justified in saying we don't need this guy around. Now, if this list were completely up to me, television would be at the very bottom. Although I do have sort of an affinity towards party rap, even I can't tolerate this awful song. Inchimel is nauseating with the kick and 808 rhythmically clashing, and Kodak's voice is also grating as all hell, and him blaming racism for his crimes is about as counter-progressive as it gets. This dude is probably one of the worst singing voices I've ever heard from a rapper, and that's really saying something. Meanwhile, I have some very different thoughts on this song. Strap in folks, because this might take a while. I hate Kodak Black. He's a terrible rapper, and if his rape allegations are true, he's a terrible person too. And yet, I don't hate this. Most of the criticism I see coming at this song has less to do with the song itself and what they think it represents. Kodak playing the race card to excuse himself from his rape allegations. But here's the thing. This song is barely about that. 
If you had no idea of Kodak's personal life, which I didn't the last time I talked about this song, I don't think you'd be able to tell that this was about rape allegations. The hook is too vague in its descriptions of what he's being sent to jail for, that and the I don't got a rape line everyone likes to point out. See, that was a terrible idea, but at least they knew it was a terrible idea and cut it out of the song before its commercial release. So no, knowing about how awful of a human being Kodak is does not make me hate this song. Although admittedly Kodak himself isn't really doing it any favors. The reason I like this song is the beat. It's surprisingly creative by trap rap standards, as the combination of acoustic guitars and flute give it a really nice, organic sound that's actually able to make me tolerate Black's nasally tone at times. They're a surprisingly good fit for the trap hi-hats, and they are insanely memorable, unlike the sludgy drones of No Flockin' or Everything 1K. If this had better lyrics, I'd even argue that this song is great, though Kodak is still being Kodak everywhere, and that is a problem, but it's not a big enough problem for me to dislike this or even find it mediocre. And there you have it. Post your comments carefully. You fucking imbecile, of course Kodak's personal life has to be brought into the analysis of the song. It's a song talking about his personal problems, boy, what are you talking about? Yeah, for like four lines of a three minute song, you expect a guy like Kodak Black to stay on topic? No, of course you don't. But it's in the chorus. Okay, you, you know what? Just, just shut Kodak up. Kodak Black you is an awful rapper. Stop. The song is terrible. Okay? You have don't. no taste I, in music. I don't know why you're even a viewer. You should just crap. quit. Just... Mama told me hey, not to sell work. Mama. Uh, the next song just started. Should we? Oh, fine. Why don't you just start? Fine. I don't like Migos. I find them derivative in their own genre, and none of the members seem to matter except for Quavo. And I don't like this song in particular primarily because it's so choppy. Migos is often attributed for popularizing what's called a triplet flow in rap music. And when done in, say, the beginning of the first verse on uh, Bad and Bougie, it, it can sound kinda cool. On the other hand, when you only fill the first two beats of a triplet, with your flow, you get this. When there's this much space in between every word of a bar, it just gets annoying to me. Staccato notes can be an important element of music, but often I feel like they can just make everything sound way too choppy and unpleasant. That and the reverb and autotune on the backing vocals is it's just really grating to me. Unlike Josh, I actually do generally like Migos. The triplet flow is actually pretty captivating, and I find the use of ad-libs to accentuate every line creative and well executed. However, even I have to admit that the t-shirt's kind of below the trio's usual standards. Although I do love the beat to this, the aforementioned staccato flow and offsets auto to make the song a bit difficult to listen to. It sounds like they're saying that much lyrically anyway. Never have and never will. You know how I complimented the organic flute sound of Tunnel Vision? Well, Maskoff's flute is pretty much the exact opposite of that. I think it's clear that this song was never meant to be big. It feels like there was so little effort put into this other than slapping on a vaguely recognizable melody from the 70s and calling it a day. Even Future sounds bored with himself on this, barely elevating himself beyond a sleepy mumble. I have to agree with Josh here. I do actually like this song. The playful flute sample sounds pretty intriguing, but its repetitive looping makes it lose its touch after a while. Future's lyrics actually are above his usual standard, and the hook is catchy as hell. However, as Josh previously said, Future doesn't even sound like he cares about this song as much as he does in other songs like Stick Talk. Future's done better in my opinion. Still better in Tunnel Vision though! Watch it! Waiting for the time to pass you by. Verses on this song are actually pretty good, but what kills it for me is the drop. All you have to do is stay a minute, just take your time. Zed, I like Alessia Cara as a performer. Please do not change this for me. I mean, Alessia is clearly the best part of the song. Although the songwriting of Stay is a tad sloppy, Kara's strong vocals really do stand out against this mess of a beat. That is, in the verses. The robotic backing vocals in the chorus really kill any vibe that the song blow up in the verses, and the drop sounds fundamentally broken as well. If I wanted to listen to a loud, obnoxious drop, I'd listen to the Chainsmokers. The drops actually have some personality, at least. God, this hurts. Speaking of the Chainsmokers, why does that sound like Zed is ripping off a bunch of different producers here? It's probably just me, but the build-up is reminiscent of Major Lazer. The drop can be found in a poor man's Chainsmokers song, and the percussion in the second verse is eerily similar to that of Sieb's I Took a Pill in Ibiza. Zed, I know you haven't had a hit as big as Clarity in recent years, but please maintain at least some artistic credibility, dude. 
tissue. It's bad and bullshit. Bad. Cooking up dope with a oozy. I'm about ready for this song to just leave, honestly. No new insight, just I'm done with it. Although I think this song is pretty damn solid, I have to agree. There are much better rap songs in the top 20 right now. Next. Yeah, yeah, looking at the truth, the money never lie, no. I'm the one, yeah. Don't let the somewhat low ranking of this fool you. TMR and I both actually kind of like this song. Look, there are some issues. The audio on Quavo, Bieber, and especially Wayne's voice could have been mixed a bit better. The braggadocious sentiment of the hook could have been executed a bit better as well. And some of the lines in the verses were loved. However, I'm the one is a pretty decent summer jam that I'm pretty happy is being played in the radio. Hook is somehow both kind of annoying yet really fun and memorable. So it, it kind of cancels out to being passable. Not high art or anything like that, but kind of fun. However, it does pain me to say that Chance has the worst verse on this. He sounds almost psychotic in the way he says make her coochie melt. Just, I don't know how to react to that. Yeah, Chance really does sound a bit out of place here. Surprisingly, Quavo probably fares best if his relatively sentimental verse dedicated to his lover. Let's need love too, I suppose. I'm in love with the shape of you. Oh, I've already talked about this song before. Although I used to like Shape of You, Extreme Overplay basically killed every positive thing I had to say about the song. However, I also did begin to notice some pretty major flaws within the song's composition as well. From the awkward phrasing of the chorus to the clunky nature of the instrumental, it's just it's a shrinker for me. Yeah, I still like it. Though it does take until the bridge for the song to start getting really good. Even still, I love that xylophone melody more and more every time I hear it. So, yeah, I think it's gonna be a while before I hit overplay fatigue on this. Eh, to each his own, I guess. I sure as hell hope we can agree on that next pick. Yeah, about that. I don't really care if you cry. I, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Push me to the edge. All my friends are dead. To me, this is pretty much clickbait the song. Even the way the title is spelt is clickbaity and cringy. On the surface, you might think that this song is about the horrors Uzi faces growing up in the environment he did, or even in his life as a famous rapper. But the problem is, that's not what the song is about. At least, not entirely. It's about all the weird noises and voices Uzi can make and just messing around on this repulsively sloppy beat. Also, his tone of voice gives me no clear indication of what I'm supposed to feel about his predicament. Am I supposed to sympathize with him? Cry? Be angry? Hate his guts? I don't know. Lil Uzi Vert is not a good performer, and he's especially not good enough to pull off a topic this dark. I might even call this my least favorite song this guy has put out just for how incompetent it is. Well, I cannot disagree more, dude. I generally do not like Lil Uzi Vert, but EXO Tour Life is actually an absolute masterpiece. For a start, the instrumental is just incredible. The bassy backbeat, eerie synths, and hardening drums set the mood perfectly. Uzi's autotune actually really helps to emphasize his distress. His slipping into various octaves is way more cohesive than it should be. Uzi killed his vocals here. Although the verses do go a bit off topic, the hook actually is really incredible. Uzi actually demonstrates emotional depth, contemplating suicide after experiencing a tragic breakup of his girlfriend. The chorus is written in the best way imaginable, and it's catchy as hell. I wish Uzi was as good normally. Now they always say congratulations. Ooh, I'm also a fan of this one. Although I did find why Iverson incredibly tepid and boring, congratulations really is a bop. For a start, the lyrical sentiment is in the right place. Will and Quavo come off as grateful, not boastful. The chorus and the pre-chorus are also catchy as hell. Metro Boomin's upbeat instrumental is a nice treat in addition. Gonna have to disagree with that big time. Yes, this is better than White Iverson, but that's only because it sounded like they put some actual effort into it. But my main problem with this song, outside of the Travis Scott-esque production that sets the mood horribly, is just how confused it is and what it's trying to accomplish with the lyrics. Everyone wanna act like they but all that mean nothing when I saw my daughter. It tries to present itself as a victory lap, which I guess both Post and Quavo deserve to take at this point, but because of the lyrics about haters and flaunting all the women and expensive things they have now, it feels more like a middle finger to the haters than a party where everyone's invited. And I can't help but feel that this was the wrong tone to set for the song in particular. In my opinion, I feel like the lashing out against the haters is justified. I mean, maybe the song is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but Post Malone and Quavo reveling in their successes can also translate to proving the haters wrong. Plus, it's not even as if the two mention their haters that much in this song. So baby, pull me in. 
me closer in the backseat of your rover. You still don't like this song? Come on, it's a bop and you know it. Andrew Taggart's voice gets way Andrew too much Taggart's crap. Frog -like like voice. Are Nausea you listening to me? I can't believe we're even having you. this conversation right like now. It's been months since this song drops. Everything about this song is transcendent. Maybe single. that's why you don't get it. I could listen to this for hours and not get sick of it. It's the song that's going to define our generation and I'm damn proud of that, you know? Next! Location, let's focus on communicating. I'm genuinely surprised that this got as big as it did. And, well, I'm glad it got big too. I didn't really think much of it when it first hit the Hot 100, but after a few more listens, I'm down with this, and with Khalid in general. He's a bit sleepy and willowy on this song, but I feel like it works to this song's advantage. It's a song about a relationship where Khalid feels that there should be more communication. That's a good message to have in pop. And the references to modern technology actually work for once because A, they're being used sparingly, and B, it works with the idea that the song is essentially taking place during a phone conversation. That and the muted guitar strumming is pretty soothing. This might be the vibiest song on the Hot 100 right now, and I'm okay with that. This is a pretty decent tune. Khalid's vocals aren't that great, but then again, this is the dude's debut single. As previously stated by Josh, the message of the track is pretty well executed. I do wish that the song was a bit more melodic, but this isn't bad for a debut. Keep up the good work, Khalid. I don't like Selena, but when you auto-tune her, sometimes she can be tolerable. Go figure. I agree with Josh. The only time that Selena Gomez ever seems to sound any good is when she's singing in a straight tone with a decent bit of auto-tune on her vocals. Consequently, her performance on It Ain't Me actually is surprisingly solid, and Vin Diesel's backing vocals actually complement Selena's contribution to the chorus as well. I also generally like the song's writing. Selena's tying everything back to the Bowery Hotel, and her attitude surprisingly comes off as likable. Personally, my favorite part of the song is the drop. It's made of these smooth vocal fragments that feel transcendent, as opposed to your typical loud EDM drop. But I guess other than that, I, I still do like this, but I wouldn't consider it very special. I like the song Kaigo did with Ellie Goulding a lot more, but that's neither here nor there. Oh, I want something just like this. Still charming, still sounds great, although I will say that it doesn't really fit with the rest of Memories Do Not Open. That album was primarily about misery, and this song is too happy for that. I actually already did do a full review of this song, the link is below. Although the lyrics are a bit more nonsensical than I would like, something just like this still holds up as a pretty good collaboration between this Chainsmokers and Coldplay. Chris Martin sounds great, and the instrumental pairing of the Chainsmokers and Coldplay works way more well than I would have expected. Plus, Andrew Taggart's not singing there. That's always a plus. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Kyle is such an asshole. Yeah, that's pretty true, I gotta admit. It's kind of amazing how much I love this song, considering how douchey Kyle comes off as here. However, the upbeat instrumental blends perfectly with Kyle's singing, and Lil Yachty actually even seems to be above average. Uh, although that nutsack line is fucking horrendous, <laughs> the rest of the song is so lighthearted and fun that I'm just bound to love it. Last time I talked about this song, I said I liked Lil Yachty's verse more than Kyle's, I, but I think that's changed a bit. Kyle may be awful to the girl he's singing to, but at least his verse has some cohesion. I don't find Yachty's references and that nutsack line very charming, but at least he's able to keep some energy going without resorting to referencing a mass shooting. But it's still great, too. So, here we are, the biggest song in the country. I've known about Despacito since it came out, but it's taken a while to grow on me. Although there are parts where I feel like his vocals sound overmixed, Luis Fonzi actually does sound great on this track. After the abomination that was Shaky Shaky, Daddy Yankee also delivers a charismatic verse. Well, as long as you don't translate those lyrics! Considering how infectious the chorus and the post chorus are, I'm pretty content to see Despacito blown up. Justin Bieber, though. Honestly, I feel like Justin Bieber makes this song kind of weaker. I am thankful that his contributions to the song made this a huge hit despite his apparent insensitivity to the Spanish language, but it's the same song over again, just with Justin Bieber singing some lines and some lines being in Spanglish. And Bieber's tones don't really flatter the tone of the song in my opinion, so the original is the clear winner for me for just how energetic and fun it is. Yeah, I just gotta agree with you there. Justin just sounds so bored here. Despacito. Ugh. The original song is still solid as hell though. 
passive with the things you say. You know, Drake is usually much better when he's singing rather than when he's rapping these days. This isn't to say that every song where Drake only sings is good, but in 2016 and 2017, he has struggled to make good on his promise that he's in the top five rappers. Really, what was the last great Drake rap song? Probably 2015's Back to Back. And I guess there were a couple good rap songs on Views too, but he's increasingly got nothing to rap about, especially in More Life. And really, the recent songs where he just sings are more memorable to me and better put together in general. Hotline Bling, One Dance, Too Good, Get It Together, and of course, Passion Fruits are all songs I enjoy a lot and none of them have any rapping whatsoever. Unlike Joss, I actually do tend to prefer Drake when he's hopping on bangers like hype and energy. However, Passion Fruit is just something special. The instrumental is audio bliss and Drake's play on the word passion fruit in the chorus is actually pretty clever. His vocal delivery is also on point here. Well, his vocal delivery and the general feel of the production. I'm glad this is one of Drake's biggest hits as of late because it's easily one of the best songs on More Life and one of the songs I feel the most effort was put into. This is a song that focuses more on vibe and pleasant melody than it does on Drake's usual demons. I've heard it compared to YouTube tutorial music, but I don't think I've ever heard a tutorial song this well composed. The xylophones are nice to listen to and I just imagine the whole thing is taking place in some pink airy room. Is that weird? I don't care. It may not be the hardest that Drake gets, even on More Life, but I feel like he needed a song like this and get it together to exercise his softer side. If only the rest of this album was more like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Playlist. Unlike some of Drake's cattier songs, Passion Fruit actually has a more upbeat vibe that allows for its quality to shine through. I do wish it would catch on a bit more on the Hot 100, but you know what? I'm so happy to see Passion Fruit sticking around, at least for now. Although I've talked about something just like this before, I've never really tackled Paris. At first, I hated the song. I thought it was pissy and instantly dated. However, the infectious melody and well-paced instrumental eventually won me over. Andrew Taggart still has a shit ton of autotune and vocal effects, but I guess even he sounds tolerable here. I'm still not a fan of the lyrical sentiment, but it can be overlooked. Overall, it's a pretty damn good song. I ranked this as the best song of this bunch. My fanboyism towards the Chainsmokers shows more and more every day, I guess. I've talked about this before, so I'll just leave it at that, at least for the rest of this year, probably. I legitimately don't see how anyone could not like this song. To be honest, I think people are just tired of hearing Tropical House and they're preemptively judging Rockabye. I remember hearing Rather Be in 2014 and thinking it was okay, nothing special, and then... Oh boy, I found out that everyone on the internet really loved that song. And yeah, I started to see what people were talking about with further listens, but I always found the song a bit overrated. Then Rockby came in and showed me that Clean Bandit actually could be as good as everyone was saying. Unlike Josh, I've loved Clean Bandit from the start. Rather Be is one of my absolute favorite hit songs of 2014 and I've been repping Clean Bandit ever since. Although Rockabye still isn't quite as good as Tears, please check that song out. It is still an incredibly potent anthem to single mothers. The lyrics are well executed and Clean Bandit's glossy backbeat is nothing short of excellent. Also, shout out to Anne Marie, another unknown gem who I've known for a fair bit. Check out her song Alarm if you're a fan of this. Plus, I love some good Sean Paul ad-lib work in a song. He made cheap thrills from last year sound more complete, and he helps this song feel even more alive. He's able to lighten up the mood and just be a force of positivity in our everyday lives. Daily struggle! It's levels to it, you and I know. This one's a bop. Although the instrumental is a bit difficult to listen to at times, Humble is still just such a hard-hitting banger that I don't even care. Although the verses aren't even Kendrick's best, the Compton rapper just keeps coming through with killer line after killer line. And the chorus, it's just so incredibly catchy and Kendrick's more aggressive delivery is on point. This isn't even the best song of Damn, that's coming up soon. I'm glad this got Kendrick his first number one as a lead artist because frankly, he deserves it at this point. Even when he's talking about putting other rappers in their place or ranting about Photoshop, this guy knows how to be engaging and clever. Also, this song might have single-handedly redeemed Mike Will Made It For Me. I wish he made more non-sucky beats more often. Just stop you crying, it's a sign of the times. I grew up on the classic rock that my parents listened to, so I was amazed when a former member of One Direction came out with a debut single and later an entire album essentially paying homage to rock acts of old. 
Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, Elton John, David Bowie, and he nails them all if you ask me. And I'm just really glad this exists. Music like this doesn't see the light of day on the Hot 100 anymore, but if you have the star power of One Direction behind you, you can bring back pretty much any genre. Everything about this song is amazing to me. Harry's light falsetto on the chorus to the later screaming at the top of his voice, the slow, methodical progression, and just the atmosphere of it all. It's the kind of music that I feel will endure for years, and probably something I could get my parents to listen to and like too. Sign of the Times definitely caught me off guard when I first heard it. I find it extremely intriguing that every One Direction member has gone a different direction since the band's dissolution. Josh basically summed up my points, although Sign of the Times is a bit repetitive. It is a very well-made glam rock anthem that is very reminiscent of David Bowie. His vocals are great, and the instrumental progresses in a very smooth manner. I wish rock like this was more prevalent, but I'll still take Sign of the Times any day. Isn't it just amazing how far Bruno Mars has progressed ever since the beginning of the decade? Although that's why I like still isn't quite as good as 24 Karat Magic, it still is a track in which Bruno Mars romantically promises his girl all of the wealth in the world. His vocals are marvelous and the 80s elements of the production surprisingly mesh well with the more modern components. However, the best part of That's Why I Like is the outstanding bridge where Bruno Mars pours his heart out. Well, I'm just so glad this hit number one. Admittedly, it feels wrong that this song went to number one, but 24 Karat Magic hit it. Regardless, I'm glad this did make it eventually. Bruno is just about the only artist who can blatantly flaunt his money around in his music and not come off as a prick. Mostly because his music has this feeling of inclusion. You're not being talked down to, you're being invited to take part in a celebration, and literally so in this song in particular. That fact and Bruno's charisma make this and the rest of the 24 Karat Magic album a great listen. I agree completely. Let's just hope Versace on the floor becomes a hit, cause that song's just on another level. Cutting straight to the chase here, this may be the best rap song of the year. Damn opens with a spoken word vignette where Kendrick gets gunned down by a blind woman, and while you're still trying to figure out what just happened, DNA plays, and kicks the intensity forth even further with a cipher of what it means to be black in the culture Kendrick grew up in. He's expected to be a thug, to gun down people and to steal to feed a starving family. After all, those tendencies are supposedly in his DNA. DNA is Kendrick Lamar at his best, and that is really saying something. Kendrick's rapping here is basically perfect from his energetic delivery, to his intricate flow, to his knack for rhyming, and the vivid descriptions of his life. However, Michael made it, damn man, he really steps up his game here. The first beat of DNA is atmospheric, hard-hitting, and haunting, but this may just be one of the best beat switches I've ever heard. The second part of DNA is Kendrick Lamar as angry as and it is just glorious. I just like to imagine that Kendrick enters the Avatar state during the second half of this song, and the fact that this part was originally an acapella that Mike Will had to make a beat around just blows my mind. The fact that DNA has a shot at making the year in this makes me extremely excited. I doubt anything's gonna top on the best list, it's just that good. That's all, thank you for watching, and thank you Josh. Stay tuned for more True Music Reviews. Take care. Ain't no more inside my DNA. So I was taking a walk the other day. And I seen a woman, a blind woman, pacing up and down the sidewalk.